from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. For centuries, adventurers and archaeologists have been digging in the sand of the Egyptian desert, searching for the treasures of the pharaohs and the secrets of a lost world. What they find is witness to a civilization thousands of years old. Works of art made to last for eternity. But countless treasures only see the light of day for a short while. Many end up in boxes and disappear in cellars and depositories. As if they'd never been dug up at all. Most are taken to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Only now can the trail of long-forgotten discoveries be picked up again, because for the first time, the museum is opening its mysterious catacombs. For a scientific expedition the like of which the world has never seen. Paul Kreisman has been waiting a long time for this day. He is in Cairo, the mecca of Egyptologists. Sabah Abdel Razak knows that a day full of surprises awaits her. She's leading the probably most unusual expedition in the whole of Egypt. Susanna Foss, an archaeologist from Hamburg, is also hoping to make her perhaps biggest discovery today. They all want to see Wafa El Sadiq, the director of Egypt's biggest museum. The museum director has invited the underwater archaeologists from Texas to a very special diving expedition. The Egyptian museum is also Susanna Foss's destination. She's looking for a work of art whose trail ran cold in Cairo a long time ago. Sabah Abdul Razek is the only one to have a key to a room that few have been allowed to enter. Since Wafa El Sadiq took up her post in February 2004, a fresh wind has been blowing through the museum's venerable halls. She wants to transform the world's largest collection of objects from Egyptian antiquity into a place for modern scholarship. And that's exactly why Paul Kreisman has travelled a few thousand kilometres to be here and why the work of museum curator Saba has transformed itself into an adventure. Wafa El Sadiq has a plan and to put it into action she needs committed Egyptian employees as well as scholars from all around the world. As always, the lady of the house begins her day with a short tour, all alone with the testimonials of a great history. But this day is not going to be a normal day for long. <laughs> Wafa El Sadiq wants to move her vision of a modern museum forward with the help of Saba, Susanna and Paul. Gone are the days when Egyptology was an old boys' club and the museum laughed off as a mere junk room. She wants something new. Susanna Foss is getting the chance that only few scientists have had the luck to get. She's being allowed to go through the museum's huge cellar to look for a lost relief. Most Egyptologists have not even been allowed to see a plan of the museum's cellar. She is making possible what for a long time was inconceivable. 
Sabah Abdul Razek is her closest colleague. She's the administrator of the cellar and the museum catalogue. Everyone has a different job, but they're all united by one mission. The intention is to research the museum's treasures more thoroughly than ever before. This includes both still undiscovered treasures as well as those that have already been on display for a long time. The daily cleaning seems to lead all thoughts of the director's visions ad absurdum. Wafa El Sadiq herself has hardly any time for her academic work. She has to keep the huge museum business running and that means fighting small battles every day. The museum is not only a temple of art in which Pharaoh Akhenaten pulls all spectators under his spell, it's also a regular place of work. The army of cleaners alone numbers 200. Amongst the cleaning staff, she's well known for her cleaning mania. That's one reason why they call Wafa El Siddiq the German. Another is because she lived in Cologne for 12 years and did her PhD in Vienna. She already dreamed of heading this museum as a young Egyptologist, to be surrounded by the beauty of Egypt's antiquity day by day. That she'd have to see to the cleaning herself, she'd never expected in a million years. She's troubled by Cairo's smog and dirt and the fine sand that the desert winds blow into the museum. How are sophisticated science, new visitor concepts or modern restoration techniques supposed to gain a foothold here? The museum's celebrity, Tutankhamun, also gets his daily morning hygiene routine. They have less than two hours to prepare the museum and its greatest treasure for the daily rush of visitors. The museum has to open daily in order to earn the money for the tight coffers of the Egyptian antiquity service. The Egyptian Museum in Cairo is the country's most visited building. Up to 10,000 visitors from all around the world go through its doors every day. That's two and a half million visitors every year. Most come only to see the star of the house, Tutankhamun, son of Akhenaten. <laughs> to this day, beholders are enchanted by the expression of the young pharaoh who died more than 3,300 years ago and whose almost untouched grave was only discovered in 1922 by Howard Carter. You can feel the history in this house. The building was meant to be a museum right from the start. It has hardly changed in the hundred years since it was built. Many objects are still standing where they were originally set up. Over time, more and more treasures have been added to the collection, and the museum's wealth has become its biggest problem. While the tourists conquer the museum, Sabah Abdel Razek is getting ready to enter that part of the building that is only open to insiders. The door to the cellar lies two floors below Tutankhamun. Sabah and her boss first entered it a few months ago, and what they find here leaves them awestruck every time. Well guarded and securely locked, it was forgotten for decades. Here, for 100 years, everything that archaeologists dug up and the museum had no room for upstairs was collected and piled up. 
Only Saba and her closest co-workers are allowed to enter these cellar rooms, always with police following behind. An underground treasure chamber of gigantic proportions. In its 10,500 square meters, there are still boxes from before World War I. Here, the finds of eminent Egyptologists are lying uninvestigated. There are also sarcophagi here that Howard Carter, the discoverer of Tutankhamun, wanted to show the public. Before the museum director took up her post, the cellar was in a hundred-year slumber. Only a handful of scientists have seen it so far. No television crew has had the permission to film for more than a few hours. The cellar is a legend, more so than many a pharaoh's tomb. This room reminds Saba of how the cellar used to look. Unknown mummies stored tightly together. In the meantime, they've removed the worst cobwebs and the centimetre-thick layers of dust and brought some light into this vault. Saba still finds it difficult to get her bearings. The cellar is a confusing labyrinth of rooms and often resembles a mass grave. A collection of skulls, probably from Nubia, from a strip of land that has long disappeared beneath the Aswan Reservoir. What secrets are contained in all the boxes, coffins and sarcophagi? Where do they come from? Since when have they been here? Saba doesn't know. Not yet. She hopes to get some idea of what this amazing confusion amounts to. She's faced with what is probably the biggest stock-taking task in the history of archaeology. When I entered the cellar for the first time, it became clear to me that this task would occupy me for my whole life. It's a difficult but wonderful job. When I'm in the cellar, I feel like I'm at an excavation. All the boxes that were brought here from all around, and nothing has been registered or numbered, nothing. My co-workers and I know that this cellar holds many surprises in store. But it's not only in the cellar that work awaits the scholars. In the museum's foyer are two of humanity's oldest boats, hardly noticed by visitors and hardly researched by scientists. The simple wooden boats are supposed to have transported loads that weighed several tons, such as a granite sarcophagus. An extraordinary technical feat at a time when screws and ship's keels had not yet been invented. But did the boats really transport the sarcophagus of Pharaoh Senusret III, the powerful 12th dynasty warlord, as antique reliefs show? Boat building technology has not exactly been the museum's focal point. And that's why Paul Creesman, underwater archaeologist from Texas and still in his mid-twenties, got permission to study the boats more closely, together with museum curator Wahid Edouard Gurigius. The planks are lying neatly on the deck of one of the two boats. But it's the other boat opposite, in seemingly worse condition, that particularly interests Paul. Thank you for taking the time to show me both of these today. The boats were discovered near the pyramids of Dashur at the end of the 19th century. They've been in the museum since it first opened, but nobody has looked into how the planks could support the heavy loads or what holds them together. From the deep grooves, Paul can see that the Egyptians hammered wedges into the boards to connect the cedar planks, a technique used to make stable hulls 3,800 years ago. I think we have an original over there. These are one of the earliest links in the study of shipbuilding technology. Uh, what we study 
in the nautical archaeology program at Texas A&M is the history of shipbuilding technology. How we progress to where we are today with the super tankers and things along those lines. This is one of the earliest steps and it provides us a very unique opportunity to study for contemporaneous hulls. We don't have that opportunity anywhere else in the world for this kind of age. These are certainly the oldest collection of boats currently available for study and analysis. In order to discover something new in the museum, Susanna Foss has to leave it. She has to go to the residential quarter of Zamalek, only a short drive away. Around 100 years ago, when the museum was still being built, the German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt lived here. Borchardt's most famous find was the bust of Nefertiti, which is now exhibited on Berlin's Museum Island. But from his records, which are still kept here, Susanna Foss knows that the archaeologist made another spectacular discovery. In 1898, in the desert location of Abu Ghurab, Borchardt excavated a unique type of temple from the early dynastic period. He documented everything in detail, and the records are among the papers he left behind. Four thousand, four hundred years ago, a colossal obelisk rose approximately 30 metres into the air at the centre of the temple complex, the solar temple of Pharaoh Neosere. Borchardt made sketches of a processional way more than 100 metres long that was decorated all over with colourful reliefs. According to his notes, the relief was nearly complete when Borchardt started his excavations. The archaeologist from Hamburg finds a wealth of drawings and photographs of the excavated relief blocks among the papers. Documents of extraordinary value. They're the only thing that remains of Borchardt's spectacular find. There would have had to be hundreds of blocks and fragments but apart from a few, their whereabouts have been unknown for the last 100 years, vanished and forgotten. Susanna Foss is searching for clues. Could she find the relief again? She discovers scenes of the so-called said feast on some photographs, a magical rite at which the aging king was endowed with youthful strength. To this day, it's unclear what exactly occurred during this rite. Ludwig Borchardt was well aware that he'd stumbled upon something special. The ancient union between sun god and pharaoh. To find the depiction of the said feast in the solar temple of Neo Zere was a big surprise and sensation for Ludwig Borchardt too. He had no idea it was there. It was known before they started their dig that these sanctums were dedicated to the sun god. They could deduce that from the name. They had already verified the names from the inscription and found they were all connected with the name Ray, the sun god. But then Borchardt found a series of depictions of this said feast in this complex, and that's a king's feast, a king's King's cult, so they suddenly had a connection between the sun cult and the king's cult at these temples, and that was completely new information. By the end of the 1901 digging season, only a fraction of the relief had been photographed, sketched and measured. In Abu Ghurab, it was the last time that the many pieces all lay together, at the foot of this wall. At the remains of the obelisk, in the ruins of the solar sanctum, the trail goes cold. Here, the finds were packed into boxes and, as was the custom at the time, sent in equal parts to Berlin and Cairo to the Egyptian Museum. 
Tahir Place in the centre of Cairo is a hectic place, and not just today. At the beginning of the 20th century, this was where the city's biggest building site was located, for the Egyptian Museum. The building wasn't finished yet, but this is exactly where Borchardt's boxes were sent. Did the lost relief vanish in the huge cellar? The museum's construction took six years. It was a project of national significance and international prestige, a neoclassical palace for truly majestic art. The idea and design for the building came from France. Since the days of the Napoleonic campaign, the Egyptian Antiquity Service had been firmly in French hands. Its founder, Auguste Mariette, wanted to create a Louvre of the Orient. An irony of history, it was Ludwig Borchardt who warned about allowing all the antiquities to be stored there without first creating a complete inventory. He feared terrible confusion and the loss of valuable artefacts. But his warning came too late. When the Egyptian Museum opened in November 1902, it displayed 35,000 objects. Now it displays more than 120,000. The exhibition rooms in the Belle Epoque style are bursting at the seams. Not included in the official catalogue are all those things in the museum's cellar that are still awaiting their discovery. For Sabah Abdel Razek, it's the most exciting place to work in the whole of the museum. Full of surprises, sometimes scary ones. A mummy, in bad condition, so decayed that little is left but the skeleton. The mask is not a protection against the legendary curse of the pharaoh, rather it's meant to protect the mummy against human bacteria that can break it down in next to no time. Who excavated it? Who was it? Perhaps a photograph will give other scientists a clue that could help identify it. In a different corner, one of Sabah's colleagues is opening a box. One of 2,000 that have been found in the museum's cellar. And again, the same question. What will it contain? There are no sketches, no lists, no data. Every time, it's like the contents had never been excavated. Everything has to be unpacked, identified and registered. They've found more than 600 sarcophagi down here so far. From the first dynasties of the third millennium BCE up to the time when the Greeks and Romans conquered Egypt. Everything is lying closely together, awaiting its rediscovery, almost like an expedition into a huge pharaonic tomb.
you have seen um, our work at the basement, and since then we have cleared a third of that area. We have documented more than 100,000 objects were lying inside the boxes at the basement. We have uh, restored them, cleaned, of course, cleaned them, and uh, sent them to local museums in Luxor, Aswan, and everywhere in Egypt to be on display because it was not correct to keep them for a long time in that basement. And I just took the chance of cleaning the basement and created a children's museum for the first time. It's unique. It's the uh, only museum in this art in, uh, in th that kind in the whole world. So um, I hope you all enjoy it. It is about 15 minutes. Thank you. Mm.